To understand the many programming languages you can choose to learn and create software with, it's important to understand, in addition to the technical details, the historical context and reason the language was created. Often they provide a solution to a series of problems encountered in previous languages which we'll have several examples of, starting with the creation of Java, which arose because of problems with C and C++. It was known since the early 90s, a time when almost all software was written in C and C++, that the majority of security vulnerabilities came from pointer bugs and buffer overflows. James Gosling, an engineer at Sun Microsystems, was frustrated by spending a significant amount of time hunting down these pointer bugs in large C and C++ code bases which is a notoriously difficult task. This eventually led him to create his own language in runtime with the garbage collector, which provides automatic memory management. In addition, Java has a strict object-oriented design intended to develop software with interfaces as contracts or signatures between objects. In this interview, James Gosling discusses the benefit of having a clear interface between different components in a large-scale project and preventing the backdoor which many developers take to bypass the intended object-oriented programming principles or establish interfaces to quickly hack something together. But also there were, you know, one of the things that you get out of object-oriented programming is a strict methodology about, you know, what are the interfaces between things? And being really clear about how parts relate to each other. Well, one of the things I did that, that, that on the one hand upset a bunch of people was that I made it so that you really couldn't go through back doors, right? So, so the whole point of that was to say, if you need, you know, if the interface here isn't right, the wrong way to deal with that is, is to go to through go a around. back door. Yep. The right way to deal with it is to walk up to the developer of this thing and say, uh, change the interface, fix it. Yep. Right. And, and so it was kind of like a social engineering thing. Yeah. And, um, it's brilliant. And people ended up discovering that that really made a difference. Another characteristic of Java besides the language itself is the architecture that it runs on. The JVM, or Java Virtual Machine, is an abstraction layer agnostic to the underlying machine, which was a brilliant new idea during its inception. In the 90s, all CPUs were very diverse and proprietary. Most applications ran on computers from different vendors with different chips and different instruction sets, such as MIPS or RISC. When writing C or C++, it had to be tailored to that specific architecture. Not only did software have to be written for specific ISAs, but it often had to be rewritten for newer generations, such as transitioning from the Motorola 68010 to the 68020, which James Gosling himself spent a year on re-implementing at Sun Microsystems. He later developed the JVM as a solution where you could write it once and run anywhere. Though people nowadays criticize Java for its large overhead, understanding the historical context of when it was created puts its design into perspective. Nowadays, Java powers the Android platform, web applications with Spring Boot, back-end server software, enterprise applications, and much more. Moving on, we have Python, created by Guido Van Rossum, working at a computing research institute in the 80s, where nearly every program they wrote was either a shell script or in C. Wishing there was a language somewhere in the middle that felt like a genuine programming language like C, but was also interpreted, easy to use, and concisely written like shell scripts, but without the poor readability. After creating Python, it was quickly adopted by fellow researchers for scripting tasks. Python's advantage is its shallow learning curve. Since it's interpreted, you don't have to compile code into a separate executable file every time you want to run it. Instead, just save your file and run a single command. What else contributes to its ease of use is its syntax, which is famously known for being simple and easy, making it the preferred beginner programming language for many, often taught in schools and universities. I personally was introduced to programming in a computer class from high school, where we built a platformer game using the K-Tinker module. Besides its shallow learning curve, another reason for Python's wide adoption is its massive package ecosystem. Importing code written by somebody else has never been easier. And if you can imagine any use case, there's surely a suitable module that exists in the half a million packages on PyPy or Python package index. According to JetBrains developer survey, Python currently sees use primarily in data analysis and machine learning, with a long list of other use cases including web development, 
system administration, and software prototyping. Moving on to JavaScript, we have to understand the early days of the internet and very first web browsers. As the demand for websites grew from static web pages to dynamic, interactive applications, the need for a scripting language specifically for the web became apparent. The idea of code injected directly into markup was new at the time, but became necessary. Working at Netscape, which later became Firefox, Brendan Eich had a deadline of 10 days to finish the language because it had to be rolled out fast during a time-critical period where the internet was booming in popularity and Netscape was in fierce competition against Microsoft's Internet Explorer for market share. JavaScript today has evolved into what people now use as a general-purpose programming language, despite originally meant for small scripting tasks. The fact that JavaScript is loosely typed means it's difficult to understand what types of data are being passed around, leading to unexpected behavior, such as referencing variables that don't exist and broken code only discovered at runtime when the browser throws an error. Because of this, it was not ideal for large applications. Developers at Microsoft realized this in 2010 when they were first building their new IDE, VS Code. The need for type safety and static type checking ahead of time allowed the developers to create their own superset on top of the language, which transpiles back to JavaScript. This became known as TypeScript. Nowadays, both JavaScript and TypeScript are widely adopted and still growing in popularity. For small scripting tasks, JavaScript is best. For large applications, either TypeScript or JavaScript paired with JS doc to comment types works best. Next we have Golang. What led to its creation was massive and complex C++ code bases at Google, taking minutes and sometimes hours to compile. In addition, the turn of the century saw languages like C++, Java, and Python as unable to handle problems introduced by multi-core processors, network systems, and modern server programs comprising tens of millions of lines of code. Go was conceived in 2007 by engineers with many notable accomplishments, such as Unix, C, UTF-8, and the Chrome V8 engine. The language was intended for big companies working on large code bases. The greatest feature of Go is its lack of features. This allows for readability, simplicity, and faster development time. Though you can define methods on types and structs, Go is not an object-oriented language, rather a procedural language heavily influenced by C. Go is designed with modern hardware and multi-core CPUs in mind. Concurrency allows fully utilizing multiple CPU cores using Go routines for execution and channels for communication. In this presentation by Rob Pike, he first discusses his experience attending various language conferences, which discussed newer features of Java, C Sharp, C++, PHP, and more. He realized these languages are competing by actively borrowing features from one another. This means, in a sense, they're all converging into the same language, all growing in complexity while becoming more similar, meaning bloat without distinction. Go does not try to compete. Since Go v1, the language has been fixed, and very few features added. It is intended as a simple-to-use procedural language. Without object-oriented features, you can focus on the task at hand rather than think about the hierarchy or type system that you have to shape into the problem that you're solving. There is no context switching, jumping around files, finding where something is inherited from. Code generally reads top to bottom in a simple manner. Go has seen widespread adoption from cloud and network services to command lines and web development, with the majority of its use being in the workplace by real businesses, as opposed to a language like Rust, which sees most of its use by hobbyists and personal projects. Because of this, in addition to me just not knowing much about the language, means I'll skip over it. Next, we have a technology that powers big business and enterprise, .NET. The story of C-Sharp begins in the late 90s, when Java was basically taking over the world. Microsoft quickly developed their own implementation called Visual J++, but realized it didn't make sense to build technology based on a license from their competitor, Sun. This led Microsoft to build their own language and architecture entirely, leading to C-Sharp and .NET. See this excerpt from the creator of C-Sharp, Anders Heilsberg, discuss the original design goals and history. And the reality is that everybody wanted the ease of use uh, of 
Visual Basics, Visual Basics Rapid Basics. Application Development, and everybody wanted the power and expressiveness that C++ had. I think we got a lot of things right. I mean, if I had to pick one thing that I, that I thought was pretty cool, it's sort of like we had this unified type system where everything is an object, even though yes. we are actually a much lower level language. And then that meant that from the get-go, we had concepts like boxing uh, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and unboxing, you know, built in and understood by the runtime deeply. Our generics implementation is pretty cool and unique in that it's reified generic meaning generics, meaning that they're understood in at runtime. You can instantiate generic types at runtime where Java's later implementation of generics is based on erasure and that has some very odd effects at runtime. Those are things that I think we got right. I think the thing we got wrong perhaps was to sort of wholesale go with established practices and allow uh, the null uh, in the door. <laughs> I, I always felt like in, in retrospect, it sure would have been nice to to try to like exercise nulls a bit more and, 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 and basically make it possible for you to have non nullable reference types. That was that was the mm -hmm. thing that that was lacking. Back in the early days, C Sharp was used primarily for building Windows applications and was bound to the Windows operating system running on .NET. However, nowadays cross-platform is possible with .NET Core. So although a lot of people still associate .NET and C Sharp with Windows only, that is no longer the case with development on Linux and Mac OS being just as feasible. Besides just desktop apps, there is much more possibility such as web apps with Blazor, mobile apps with Maui, previously Xamarin, and even game development with the Godot and Unity engine. There's a common phenomenon of developers rejecting C Sharp for political reasons, as in they don't like Microsoft, but the company is no longer the villain of open source that they once were. This could be a topic for a whole nother video, but to summarize, Microsoft historically had a terrible reputation with the open source community under CEO Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer but the company has seen a radical shift from closed source and anti-competitive behavior to open source and collaborative under Satya Nadella. His first year as CEO, he gave away .NET to the .NET Foundation, separate from Microsoft. The rewrite of .NET to .NET Core was no longer closed source and proprietary, and nowadays Microsoft is second to the open source contributor index behind Google. Because of this culture and history of smaller companies and startups being anti-Microsoft, You'll rarely find C Sharp and .NET in these types of jobs, instead finding employment in larger, stable companies like banks, insurance companies, and healthcare, where startups and tech companies are likely to use anything but C Sharp. Before finishing off the video, I'd like to go over employment and usage statistics. After searching for a particular language wrapped in quotes with the word software on Indeed, here are the results I found. You can see Java and Python having the largest number of jobs, and Go with, with the lowest. Although it may not be accurate because of the difficulty of searching a general word like Go, giving false positives. This is a result of searching for Go Lang, but I suspect many jobs just refer to it as Go, which this search did not pick up. If you have some clever way to search for more accurate results, please leave it in the comments. Moving on to the usage statistics, I've gathered data here from a yearly Stack Overflow survey where professional developers report which language they've worked with extensively in the past year. If you'd like to explore this data, you can find the website in the description. That sums up the video and thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe to support more content like this.